The M4 Sherman was a fast and reliable medium tank that served in massive numbers for the Allies during World War II. Although its drawbacks often outweighed its virtues on the battlefield, no other tank of its era could match the exceptional balance and versatility of the legendary Sherman. Tom Chikansky is the director of exhibits and collections at the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. The Sherman was one of the most balanced tanks of World War II. Although lacking in critical areas, it was fast, dependable, and above all, easy to manufacture. Designed for mass production and rapid delivery to the front, the ubiquitous Sherman served in every theater of operation in World War II as the Allies' principal medium tank. One of the major advantages of a medium tank is mobility. The Sherman had a top speed of about 26 miles an hour. This meant you could get a whole company of tanks or even a whole tank division anywhere you needed to go in a hurry. Despite its advantage of speed and mobility, the Sherman's off-road performance posed a major challenge for its crews. One of the fixes they came up with was the E9 model of Sherman's. This particular tank was equipped with spacers. Normally this side of the track would be located about here, and this edge would be at the edge of the tank. Longer track connectors could be fitted out, and thus provide a wider track having additional space here, and likewise out here. Other modifications added much needed protection for the Sherman's vulnerable crew. The Sherman was very under-armored. The Germans had a wide variety of anti-tank weapons that would punch through any piece of the Sherman's armor. Even their Panzerfaust, an individual anti-tank weapon, would punch through the frontal armor of the Sherman. Even more dangerous was the infamous 88, a high-velocity anti-aircraft gun improvised by the Germans into the most feared anti-tank weapon of World War II. To help safeguard the crewmen, measures were taken to protect critical areas of the Sherman's hull. You can see here in front of the gunner, a large thickness of applique armor was applied. This armor was put on to the cast turret and then welded on and built up and welded on and built up to provide additional thickness at this critical point. There's another piece of applique armor mounted in front of the driver and the assistant driver. And as you can see here, Crews would often place sandbags to provide additional coverage. Despite these efforts, the Sherman's armor was still no match for the dreaded 88s. Nor could it stand up to the Germans' deadly Panther and Tiger tanks, which took a heavy toll on the Sherman crews across Europe. The Sherman had an additional disadvantage in that the ammunition was stowed all over the place. This meant wherever the Sherman was hit, it was likely to catch fire. In an effort to improve the survival characteristics of this tank, applique armor was added over the magazines. Behind this plate, main gun rounds were stored, and so it was important to try and keep this area from being penetrated. The Sherman was armed with a full traverse 75 millimeter main gun, supported by three powerful Browning automatic machine guns. The Sherman tank is equipped with two 30 caliber machine guns. This is the 1919 Browning. One of them is mounted alongside the main gun. That's called a coax mount, and it's fired by the gunner. Wherever the main gun's pointed, that's where that 30 caliber is. The second 30 caliber machine gun is located in the bow of the tank. The uh, 50 caliber machine gun is installed on the turret, and its main purpose is to provide anti-aircraft support. The Sherman 75mm main gun provided the firepower for its main objective, but like its armor, it too often fell short in combat. What this gun does, mostly, is bounce off of German armor. The only way this gun was going to take out German armor was through a side shot or a rear shot. Engaging the Germans' Tiger and Panther tanks required exceptional teamwork, with each member of the Sherman's crew working together to provide the gunner with critical targeting opportunities. The driver was located forward and below the level of the turret. He was attempting to keep as much of the vehicle concealed as possible and provide a stable and smooth ride so that the gunner would not be thrown off target. This is the gunner's position. He could traverse the turret. He also elevated and depressed the main gun. He was provided with two sights, a periscope fixed to the main gun he also has a four-power telescope located here, which provides a better sight and more accurate shot. The loader would handle 75-millimeter shells like this, 
which he would loan into the main gun. He also would refill the 30 caliber machine gun located here that was also fired by the gunner. Although tasked primarily for tank-to-tank -tank combat in Europe, Sherman crews in the Pacific fought a much different war against a very different enemy. The major difference between Europe and the Pacific was that the Japanese lacked any heavy tank. So in the Pacific, the Sherman was often used as infantry support. Typically, three tanks would move out together. When the Japanese would swarm up onto the lead tank with mines and hand grenades, the tanks in the rear would open up with their machine guns and shoot the infantry off of it. In Europe, the Sherman's job was to engage enemy tanks. Although we would usually lose several tanks for every German tank we knocked out, we could build twice as many as we lost. More than 50,000 Shermans were produced during the war, and we were able to supply them to our allies on every front. So in the end, it was the combination of speed, reliability, and mass production that made the Sherman one of the iconic tanks of World War II.